Hello, everybody. Um, welcome to our, for our um, webinar on navigating the job market. Um, I'd thank, like to thank you all for joining us. Um, we are going to um, have questions later on in the session. Um, just to give you a little bit of um, information about how this will go, we do have one panelist who has to leave a bit early. So I will be having um, Q&A directly after his presentation, but then we will hold Q&A for the end for everybody else, okay? So I am going to get started with sharing my screen. My name is Jana Parker, and I am the Vice President for Engagement at the Academy of Marketing Science. And I'd like to thank you all today um, for joining us. And let's do my slideshow. Oh, just a minute here. On tips for navigating the academic job market. Um, we wanted to put this together because everybody who is on this panel today, including myself, we've served on a lot of search committees. And I will tell you, you will like it when you are on the other side on the search committee. But we do all remember what it is like to be a doctoral student looking for that first job. So this session is meant to be as helpful as possible. Um, the job market has changed a lot since all of us were on it as far as the way things are going due to COVID. So we will be, do our best to also give you some tips on that. So today, um, my panelists, we have um, Frank Adams, uh, Nina Cray, Varsha Jane, and Chris Hopkins, and I'm Jana Parker. And we are going to go ahead and start with Frank. So, oh, there are pictures again. Okay, and our this is our agenda. We're going to be covering cover letters, initial interviews, lots of different topics today. We'll be going through this very quickly. We do have a lot of information. And so, Frank, I'm going to let you start. Okay, well, thank you very much. Um, I think, uh, Jenna, timed this in such a way so that I could go first, and that way the others could repair all the damage when we're done. So, um, but I'm Frank Adams. I'm at Mississippi State University. I was a graduate of the University of Alabama's doctoral program. Um, I do some marketing strategy. I tend to specialize in supply chain management. But um, I wanted to talk to you just about a few things today uh, as we discussed among the panelists what we were going to cover here and what's important to, uh, to really consider. Um, we wanted to start with cover letters. Um, your cover letter, I'll tell you honestly, it's going to get read but in what depth it gets read sort of depends on you. The thing that will cause somebody to glaze over immediately is if you are obviously submitting to a committee a form letter that you're sending to everybody else. For every packet you're gonna submit, you need a customized cover letter. I would almost suggest that if you think the job is not worth uh, customizing a cover letter, the job's probably not worth applying to. But um, it's just a signal of respect and your intention and your interest, because one of the things that a faculty member is interested in is seeing an applicant that's interested in them. So uh, some of the things you want to do, I mentioned this in the bullet points here, is you want to make sure you use keywords. Go through the job announcement from the employing, uh, from the institution you're applying to, look carefully at what it is they said that they wanted. And you don't necessarily have to repeat their request or what they were calling for, what the minimum requirements are, but you want to make sure the text in your cover letter somehow addresses or touches on those things that were specific to the search. If they see that, if the committee sees that, they're going to key in and, number one, take you more seriously, but they're going to give a much more um, critically friendly eye toward what you're saying and, and uh, your interest in them. Um, one of the other things that will protect you from making it sound like you're sending a form letter is to make sure you personalize the address on these, uh, these letters. Find out who the search chair is. <clears throat> if you simply can't address it specifically to the department head, but uh, it's, it's worth it, honestly, to give the institution a call if you can't see who the search chair is and just ask the departmental administrator okay, who's running this thing? And tailor your letter to that, uh, that person in order to catch their attention. And one of the things you wanna do is before you finalize that letter, take time to read it to yourself out loud. Stuff, when you write it down the first time, makes perfect sense in your head, but it doesn't actually 
make sense to anybody else. And it's hard to get around that without having somebody proofread it for you. But a lot of times, if you will just go through and read it to yourself out loud, you'll hear things like, oh, wait a minute, I, you know, that's too long a sentence, or um, I repeated a word, or I left a word out. That's one of my personal levels. Um, these are the kind of things you want to be looking for uh, when you're working on your cover letter. So another, let's see. Oops. I think we went too far. Ah, there we go. Another thing to keep in mind about this, this process that goes on, you're certainly a part of it and you certainly have influence on it, but you're not in control of this process. Um, and I'll be talking about that in a little more depth later on, but um, other things you wanna do when you're applying to a uh, position is almost all these institutions, even if it's a teaching school, are gonna have some interest in your research and where you are with it. I know when we consider candidates, the, uh, we are considered an R1. The first thing we look at is, are they gonna be done with that dissertation? Um, make it clear when you're expecting to defend. Because especially if you're at a balanced school or going for a research school, one thing they don't want to think is that you're going to be coming to their faculty and having to spend all your energy on completing a dissertation while you're trying to, uh, uh, to get used to being on a new faculty, too. Um, is what you're doing publishable? And this does, you know, that it's better, of course, if your idea and your dissertation looks like something that's going to, uh, to go. But um, if you've got like a really um, narrow focus, or, you know, you're really, uh, for example, if your dissertation is going is aimed at, say, um, JCR, and you're going to wind up having to use up all your studies on one submission to JCR, you want to show something else you've got in your pipeline that says you're going to be able to publish and meet their tenure standards as you go forward. That's another one we kind of look for here. And the last piece I say about research kind of goes back to cover letters, too. When you're positioning yourself, you need to look at the research and the expertise on that faculty. Are there people you're going to be able to work with? Um, or is your specialty area something that you can apply? And that's another thing you want to go into your cover letter is basically talk about what your future research is and put language in there such that people can see, I could work with this guy on this piece here. Now, let's face it, not everybody's research is gonna match with every institution institution. Mine did not. I was a supply chain scholar and the folks here were much more behavioral. But at that point, you're positioning yourself as a supplement. What I can bring to you at the new institution is X. Uh, don't be afraid to sell that. So going back to this process and not being in control of it, I don't know anybody who went through the first job market without a certain amount of panic. Uh, I, I think if you were cool, calm, and collected on your first attempt to get an academic job, you must be a sociopath. So um, don't worry about the stress. I mean, it's going to be hard to ignore. But what you have to remember is there's a process going on that you can't see. You're participating in it, but it's also being done to you by others. And one of the things about academics is we are terrible at organizing ourselves. So sometimes when it seems like it's taken forever for you to hear back, that's because these guys are still shooting the rapids in Wyoming on their summer trip or whatever, and they haven't even looked at the package yet. So don't make the worst assumption just because you don't hear something right away and start letting it eat holes in you. Okay, how do you keep calm? The answer is you use the time that you're waiting to get your research done. Focus on your dissertation. Focus on uh, building that other pipeline. Um, rather than sitting around just biting your fingernails and driving yourself crazy, make use of that time productively because there's going to be lags. It's like you're going to rush to get out all your packets and then you're going to wait. And then you're going to start to get people asking if you would have a talk with them about the position and you're going to schedule and then you're going to wait. And then you'll have the talk with them and then you're going to wait 
and it, so there's all these dead spaces, which is just guaranteed to give you ulcers if you let yourself sit there and think about them all day, where you really want to be making better use of that time and uh, being able to produce some more research, being able to maybe uh, get preps ready if you know what kind of classes you're going to be teaching, but do something besides just drive yourself up the wall and just keep calm. All right. So Frank, we've had uh, one question that came out as you were talking about like pipeline mm -hmm. and things like that. Mm -hmm. What would you see as being a good example of for the pipeline to mention in the cover letter? Um, How would you write that? You know, it's going to be a very individual question. Um, it depends on what uh, projects you have going, but you might, when you're talking about your dissertation, talk about where you are aiming research. Um, so for example, I'm doing, if you're doing a three essay, essay one is at, uh, under review at this place, essay two is being prepared for that place. Um, if you're doing a traditional, uh, you might focus on what's the uh, future research section of your dissertation and say, okay, from this, we see that studies need to be done with so over here and I'm preparing a manuscript for journal so-and-so. Now, the temptation is to say all this stuff is going to JM. Uh -uh. <laughs> you know, don't do that. Everybody knows that, uh, that not everybody's getting into JM. Certainly aim high. Aim as high as your research will go, but give yourself kind of a portfolio of stuff that you have a better chance of hitting, maybe. Um, it, and it, again, it sort of depends on the standards of the institution you're going to. So earlier you talked about um, personalizing and, and, and tailoring the um, cover letter. So could you give us an example of maybe an opening statement, say a job position for um, at Mississippi State, sure. the kind of thing you would like to see in that just opening paragraph to catch your attention? Right. Um, Mississippi State doesn't have a... Um, I would not say we have like a real departmental focus to what people research here, um, but we do have, for example, a biometrics lab uh, measures palm sweat. Um, if uh, people will let you put grease in their hair, we'll even read what's going on in your brain when you're looking at uh, when you're looking at an ad or something. But if you were going to be applying to us, um, you want to mention something about the school that sort of positions you by saying. I know, you know, for example, I know how to use biometric research tools, or I'm really interested in building my skill set uh, by adding biometrics to the studies I'm doing because I think it would benefit me like this. That's one way to do it. Another is um, we have somebody with a really defined train of research. He's very productive here, Joel Collier, who does services. If you're in an arena that sort of is services, or if you see research he's doing, perhaps that would fit um, with his skill set or has implications in the services area, that's a good one. Uh, maybe to say future projects I want to do include, or ways I can adapt or break out studies from my dissertation include. And then uh, make mention of these things that maybe jive with some of his future calls for research. Okay. All right. So I need to wrap this up. Um, okay. But there is one question I want to ask that came from somebody. And then we can address some of these later. Um, but this one, um, somebody asked about, is it worthwhile to mention personal reasons why you're interested in the university and the cover letters, your the location, family, personal connection? So do you see that as being a, a plus or a minus? Um, on the whole, no. An institution likes to feel like you're excited about being in the place where they live, certainly, but um, especially if you're going for a more research-oriented school, they're not interested in hearing you're going to be close by your mom. Uh, they, they don't want necessarily uh, to be thinking, ah, the only reason they're coming here is so that they can dump their laundry at their parents' place every weekend. 
and we're not going to get much out of them. Um, you know, same thing for I love the mountains around, you know, Colorado State University. Uh, you know, you, you're pretty much telling them at that point, this guy's going to be out hiking all week. <laughs> you know, so you, you want to you want to be careful about that and keep the focus on the things that um, are most valuable to the institution. And that may be covering classes that they have if they're very teaching oriented or if they're making specific requests for uh, for teaching certain classes, or it may be in more in the research stream. It just kind of depends. All right. Well, thank you so much. And we are going to move on to Nina and um, the topic she's going to cover for us. So thank you. Okay. Okay, so we're gonna move on and I wanna pivot a little bit what Frank is saying. So let's assume uh, we read your cover letter. We love your cover letter, your next step, right? Uh, we invite you for the initial interview. So you passed uh, the first screening. We were impressed. Most of the time right now, I guess this initial interview is actually gonna be online, right? So the do's and don'ts, what, what should you be doing? What should you not be doing, right? Just like the research that you did that went into the cover letter, right? You want it to be personal, you want to address us. This is the same research that you have to put into this initial interview. So it starts all over again. You should be preparing for this, right? So do your research, know the university, know specifically what job did you apply for? Right, so recall, because I know, we all know that you applied for not just one job, right? You applied for a bunch of jobs, but when you are in this interview, you have maybe 20 minutes, maybe 30, right? Maybe 10, maybe 15. You need to make sure that you can differentiate what was the job, what was the university, right? So go back to the initial posting, which means keep the initial posting. It might be removed, right? Who knows? So keep that posting, go back to it, and then, dive deeper into the university. Make sure if you can, like right, what Frank already said, when you address the cover letter, know who you are addressing. Now, know who is gonna be interviewing you, right? If possible, find out everybody who will be, quote unquote, in the room, who will be on Zoom, on Skype, whatever it might be, right? Because you wanna be able to relate to them. You wanna know their names, you wanna creep up on them, find out their research streams, right? Go on the department website. So you want to kind of know everybody in the department, but specifically the people that will be interviewing you. Find out their research streams. Find something that you have in common with them, right? Again, be prepared. Then um, prepare questions. We, every, every time we interview somebody at the end, we ask, do you have any questions? Your answer needs to be, yeah, I do. I am prepared, right? This shows that you have interest in the position. Right. So, yeah, you need to prepare questions. I don't really care what you're going to ask me as long as you don't ask me right now about uh, the salary. How much are you going to be getting? Because you're not there yet. Right. You don't have the job, but you should be prepared. Show me that you care. Show me that you have done research. Ask me something about that you saw on the website about something about the university. Ask me about research support, ask me about something, right? But you should have questions. It's the worst thing if I ask, hey, do you have any questions? And you say, uh, no, not really. It's for me, now you come across as you don't really care about the job. If you don't care, why should I care about you, right? And during the interview, especially if it is virtual, be aware of your surroundings, right? So, is there something weird behind you? Can we see like everything in uh, your apartment or wherever you might be when you are conducting the interview? Uh, blur your background, right? If somebody is there. Like we, we understand that you might get interrupted, especially if you are on campus and that is fine, but anything that you can prevent beforehand, prevent it, <laughs> meaning dress appropriately. This is an interview. It might be virtual, but we don't wanna see you in pajamas. Or Turn on the camera. If you don't turn on the camera, you're out. If I can't look at you, you're already like, we have too many candidates anyway, so you're already done. Uh, as well as you should silence your phone or 
all those notifications, right? I don't need to know that your homeboy just like texted you or like you have a notification or you just scored on something or the weirdest things that I keep seeing on these notifications, turn them off, right? This is a professional interview. We don't need to see that much personal stuff about you, right? Again, turn everything off. Don't get distracted. And then um, if you need water or coffee or something, like have that close by. Most importantly for me is whatever software the university is using, practice beforehand, right? Log into the account. Remember, like we set up a lot of these interviews back to back, meaning we have like five, maybe 10 minutes in between. If it takes you 20 minutes to log into the account or to connect with the person, you just screwed up our, our entire schedule. <laughs> That means your time went from 30 to five minutes because we can't push everybody else back, right? So be attentive to that. Okay. We can move forward to the next slide. Oh yeah. Um, just very, very briefly for the international people, the international perspective, um, when you want to come to the U.S. or maybe you've studied in the U.S. and you are not uh, a native or a U.S. citizen, right? It can be a little bit more tricky to navigate the job market, right? Like what Frank already kind of talked about, there are different types of universities. Um, you need to be more aware of it, right? What do you want? Is it a teaching university? Is it a balance? Is it research? Based on that, there will be different requirements, right? you will have a different teaching load. There are different expectations as far as not just how much you need to publish, but where to publish, right? And service requirements will also fluctuate based on these different systems. Um, it might really be difficult if you have not studied in the US before, right? From an outsider perspective to grasp what is the difference. And I would highly encourage you to reach out to somebody that is in the US before you apply for a job to really understand the difference in these types of universities and to really know what you want in your life, right? Because this is a big decision for you. It's not something of, oh, I don't like it. Um, after a semester, I can just leave. Remember, this is a tiny community, right? We, we might think there are so many professors, I'm competing with so many people, but it's a tiny, tiny community. We all know each other somehow, right? You might know of somebody who knows of somebody that knows my advisor that knows of, right? It's a tiny community. So it's not good if you accept a job and you leave after like two or three weeks. So do your research beforehand. Also be aware of any of those legal considerations, right? Every country has different legal requirements of what you can and cannot put on your CV, right? So where I'm from, we can put pictures on a CV. In the US, that's a big no-no. We also put where we were born, you know, if we have children, our age, right? We put a lot of personal inf information. In the US, don't put that information. That already puts you out of the running because now we cannot consider you anymore. So you need to be aware of all of these requirements. Um, sponsorship, right? That's a big thing. Uh, universities nowadays will maybe put a statement in the application. Um, if not, can you ask about it? Can you not ask about it, right? Those are questions and considerations you need to keep in mind. Uh, something that I see a lot of, right? These, it's a stereotype, birds of a feather stick together, right? Or um, especially if you study in the US, it's very common that I see, and it's natural for us to want to stick together to the people that we know, right? And it's not just international people. We, we always like to do that. We go to conferences, right? We like to stick to the people that we know. I encourage you to get out of your comfort zone, especially when you close to the, to the job market period, right? Why? Because you need to connect. You need to make sure that you get to know as many people as you can, especially if you are international. You wanna make sure that you branch out a little bit more so that hiring institutions see that you're not, they're not gonna hire you and you're just gonna be like this lonely person by yourself, right? Why? Because they're hiring a colleague. They're hiring somebody to become part of the department. And if you always stick to yourself, that can actually hurt you, right? So keep that in mind. So I don't wanna to talk too much for this perspective because I'm assuming we're not just gonna have international faculty or future faculty members right now, but if you have any questions, feel free to reach out to me. Okay. Um. Thank you, Sarah. Um, 
thank you so much, Nina. And now we are going to move on to Varsha because we'll save um, questions now for the panelists until the very end. So thank you, Varsha. I'm going to put your slide up. Yeah, thanks, Jenna. Uh, I think, um, thanks, Nina and uh, Frank. Uh, most of the things I think you have covered, what I'm trying to uh, start off with is um, how to develop a research portfolio and what we're looking for when we are hiring the uh, faculty, especially from the marketing area. So uh, this is something which is very important. And I think in a way it was covered by the other panelists, but I want to emphasize here that uh, wherever in uh, university you're applying, you need to understand the structure of the university, what are the different centers uh, that uh, they have, what are the different kind of faculty which they are having, and how you would be able to contribute and, uh, you know, make some significant contributions, so to say, to that particular university, because it's a win-win situation uh, for both the parties. So that is something which is very important. And uh, then, of course, the culture. So culture of every university uh, is very different. Uh, it also differs from country to country. You need to be aware about the culture as Nina was speaking about uh, US and non-US market. In some of the emerging countries, uh, Singapore is very different uh, from the European market. And I think you need to understand within that the cultures of the universities are very different. I would suggest you need to talk to the people who are already there so that you understand uh, what exactly they are looking for when they're hiring the people. And your focused areas have to be very clear in terms of uh, how do you project that uh, in terms of your portfolio management and all of that. And while you're designing, I think Frank touched upon it a little bit, but I just wanted to ensure that when you're applying, at least you have this uh, two by two by two, which means that at least two papers in the conference maybe, and two papers uh, ongoing. And uh, you know some two ideas if you have, which is coming from your uh, own thesis, which you are going to develop or you have already developed. So this is something which is very important because at least it provides a widened portfolio and it's not only about targeting a particular journal, like she mentioned about JM or JAMS, but it's also, you know, uh, having that kind of a research which makes sense, which is relatable to that particular university, which is also making sense to that particular department where you would like to work. So, for example, uh, you know, most of the European uh, universities nowadays, they are focusing on sustainability and digital aspects. So if your portfolio connects with that particular aspect, it makes sense completely that your profile and the papers that you've been working on or what you target to work upon is aligned with what they are looking for, then obviously uh, you have the chance to get in. So that is something which I think uh, is very important to uh, look into. And you always have to work on a portfolio like you know five years or something, which would give you the direction and also give the directions to the panel members. Like when we see the portfolio, we should be able to understand that the clarity of the thoughts are there, the ideas are very clear and where you would like to head your research into. And of course, uh, you will have to ensure that, uh, you know, uh, how would you contribute that particular research in that particular university, if there are facilities that are available, how would they be able to leverage that, or in case if they are planning to come up with a new uh, department, or maybe a center, then in that case, uh, if you have that information, then you can always say that this is where I would like to contribute, for example, sales, for example, digital. Now, or customer engagement for that matter. So there are different type of centers and that information you will be able to collect when you, you know somebody from that university and that's how you're able to collect that particular information and get going with that particular uh, idea and the thought process which you can present in front of the panel. And that is really appreciated. But if you do not have those kind of information and you do not customize your mindset, then it becomes very difficult uh, to take this further. And of course, uh, your uh, you know, portfolio has to talk about what you have planned now and what is your futuristic uh, portfolio. So, you know, uh, future planning is also very much required. That also says that how much uh, structured you are in terms of your thinking 
And uh, of course, uh, in the panel, we always look for the extension of the thesis. It cannot be, you can't restrict yourself to that thesis area only, but you should be open for the other areas as well, because uh, you know that also widens the opportunities which you can get in the university. So that is something which is important. Uh, some of the examples I just quoted is to ensure that you understand the difference. Every university is very different and they look for different type of portfolio. Some universities, they, they, they may also ask you to send their video of a three minutes or two minutes, depending upon what your work you're doing. So that's initial screening for them because that gives us a hang that how much you are into the area, how much you would like to contribute and go ahead. So that is something which is very important while you're developing the research portfolio. The passion and energy should be reflected while the work which you're submitting uh, while you are uh, applying for any job, especially in the marketing area for the international universities. Then I will go for the next slide. Yeah, so uh, here uh, for the initial interview, as uh, I think, uh, uh, Nina uh, spoke about it, but I also wanted to elaborate a little further because this is something which is very important, which says that yes or no. So here, uh, the situation which is where, uh, what are the different type of, uh, you know, uh, opportunities which are been available in that particular university department, all that assessments have to be done in advance, all the details have to be curated, you need to understand who, who is the head of the department, who is the team, who is, uh, what is the, their work, their, uh, you know, profile, their research, and the better understanding you have about the panel, the better it is for you. So this is like a background check which you have to do uh, before you come for the initial interview, I would say, because it really helps. And then, of course, uh, your action points are very important that, okay, finally, if you have the background of that university that, okay, I felt that you're coming up with a sales uh, center, and this is where my uh, work is aligned, this is where I would like to contribute, and that's where you can actually talk about and, uh, you know, discuss that how you would be able to add more value to the university. That is something which is much appreciated. And of course, uh, finally, when you're talking about everything aspect of your portfolio, uh, you should also leverage that finally, after doing your dissertation, uh, what was the end result? Uh, finally, uh, at least it is expected uh, in the non-US market as well uh, to have and be a publication. That's bare minimum for more, most of the universities. And it uh, the Quality, of course, uh, is uh, aiming for the A stars and uh, FT50, but at least that is something which is expected uh, from that candidate. And then accordingly, you can uh, place your portfolio and then say that this is what you're looking for. This are the conferences which you're doing. I would also mention here that, you know, if you've reviewed for a conference or if you are reviewing for those conferences, that also can be mentioned, which is again, an added advantage, which says that you are trying to become a holistic scholar and trying to contribute uh, in a, a significant way as a reviewer uh, for, maybe it may be for the conference, that's okay. But at least, you know, it makes uh, some of the points in terms of understanding that yes, you are not only working on your portfolio, but you are also helping the, uh, academic community. So that is something which is important uh, while you're preparing for your initial interview. And the initial interview, I would also say that be clear about what you need to do and where you need to do. I think Nina also spoke about uh, like-minded people. You should be clarifying yourself that yes, this is what I want to do. And that is where you are heading. So that clarity reflects while you are in the interview. So that is important. So yeah, so this is uh, what I just wanted to mention that uh, now, as we all know that we are working and teaching in different formats, it could be offline, it could be online, it could be hybrid. And uh, when you're applying to any university, you should be ready for to be into any kind of format for online as we have all uh, made the transition from offline to online. So we are comfortable with online now, then we are also be comfortable with the hybrid structure. 
because some of the students might be in the session, some of the students might be online, uh, and you have to manage all of that. So you should be comfortable uh, in managing those kind of transitions. And, uh, you know, this can be uh, adjusted if you're doing like a, a kind of a work with the professors uh, earlier. So that really helps you to get into that particular space. And while you're doing the doctoral uh, journey at that point of time, if you're the teaching assistant of the respective professors in your university, that really helps you to get into those spaces of online or offline or hybrid mode, because the content which has been uh, there for the online uh, hybrid and uh, offline are completely different. The deliveries are different, assessments are different. And uh, I think when we are uh, hiring a faculty, the dean or the head of the department will not have the time to train any faculty and they would appreciate if they know how to juggle between all these modes and uh, get going with the teaching plan and the teaching objective basis what is expected from them because uh, that will really help them to expedite the process. So this is something which we wanted to discuss and uh, bring to your notice because besides the research portfolio, this is something uh, which is very important. Most of the universities have mentioned the kind of mode which has to be used by the uh, faculty. Yeah, thank you. Thank you, Jenna. Thank you so much, Varsha. And one thing I wanna say about this with the teaching, this is where doing your research beforehand, and like you said, you go on their website. Most universities even will talk about in their, in their marketing department or whatever, things that they're doing in their classrooms. And so you should know that and be able to do that research so you can talk about this. Um, all right, so next we have Chris. So, um, and then we will have a little bit more time for Q&A. So thank you, Varsha. And Chris, here are your slides. Chris, you're still muted. There we go. That I was uh, needed to unmute myself. Um, the greetings, I'm Chris Hopkins. I'm the department chair at uh, Auburn mm -hmm. University Department of Marketing. Um, so a rather fortuitous timing to be doing this particular webinar as just last week we had three individuals uh, do campus business with us here at Auburn and I'm going to be speaking about a number of things that I noticed in these and all of the subsequent uh, campus visits I've uh, been privy to in the past 20 years of my career. Um, so I first want to just tell you a few things that I think you should do when you begin the campus visit process. And uh, a lot of this reiterates uh, the things that my other uh, colleagues on the panel have mentioned. But, uh, you know, first thing, find out uh, what is expected in your presentation. All of you are going to be expected to do a presentation. And different departments may have slightly different expectations in terms of what they're expecting. Uh, you know, the first question, which seems rather mundane, but it's important, how much time is a lot? Because if you know how much time is allotted, I've been in some where it was 45 minutes, some it's an hour. That has a tremendous impact on what you present. Um, some will expect just a research presentation and they will give you a time. If you have an hour, uh, they will probably say 40 minutes for the presentation and then 20 minutes for questions. But what I'm, I'm seeing more and more, they don't just want to hear about your research. They also want to hear about your service interests and your teaching interests. So how do you balance that? If uh, I, I would look at it this way, if you divide it into three areas, I would say that one third of your presentation should be devoted to teaching and service together. And then the other two thirds devoted to your presentation. And your presentation, um, if, if you're straight out of your doctoral program, is obviously going to be your dissertation. One thing that I would suggest, um, what they want to see in that presentation uh, relative to your research is they want to see uh, what's your research question are you addressing? Why is this important? What theory are you proposing? And what are you hypothesizing? And what are you finding? Some limited message on the methodology you used is appropriate, 
But unless you're talking to a room full of methodologists like myself, they don't really care about hearing how you assess common method variance and endogeneity, okay? Those are not things that most people are gonna be interested in. It's more about overall, what are you studying and what did you find? More importantly, what and what contribution does it make to the extant literature? Um, other colleagues here have all, I think, mentioned researching the institution. Um, I strongly reiterate that for your campus visit as well. And um, when we talk about you know, researching the institution, it's not just the institution at large, but the specifics associated with the department are very important. Um, one of the things that's important to know is, you know, a, Departments are like strategic business units in a business and they all have a strategy, they have a mission. It's good to know that. Now, if you cannot find that on the website, you can probably find what the strategic mission is for the college. And I feel quite certain that the departmental strategic missions are going to be very similar to that of the college. It's good to know what that is because it gives you some idea of what things you need to explain about yourself in the interview. Um, you know, be familiar with the research streams of the faculty. Um, that goes without saying. Uh, just having knowledge of what everyone is working on, um, I think it's a little bit easier at a school like Auburn where I'm at because we, and we state this in our ad, we are a frontline oriented department. We are not a CB department. We do not have a behavioral lab. If you are a CB person, Auburn's really not the right fit for you. And you, in a lot, a lot of ways, would probably be wasting your time interviewing there because you're not gonna wanna be here any more than you would be a fit for what we do. So that, that has dual benefit for you and for the, the department that you're interviewing with. Um, uh, I think it's also uh, advantageous to be able to cite specific works that certain people have done. Um, nobody wants to hear, uh, loves hearing anything more than their name and especially how their name has appeared in print. So you are paying a great deal of respect to someone when you mention that. You know, next, be familiar with the research streams of the faculty. Um, that leads right into identifying the people that you can work with. Um, one thing that I would caution you about, because I've heard people say this before on interviews, oh, I can work with everybody here. I can do something with everybody. That sounds very disingenuous. Don't say that. Look for the people that specifically are doing things in your area. And all you have to do is look at their Vita. And most schools now post Vitas right on the websites, you can look up what people are doing and look at the specific things that are doing that are very similar and synergistic with what you're doing in your dissertation and what you have interest in. Um, those are the things you wanna cite. Saying, oh, I can work with everybody um, looks very patronizing. And I don't think you wanna say that. Um, it's also equally important to know uh, identifying teaching needs. Um, it's very common. You will probably be asked this on your first initial interview and you will be asked it multiple times by multiple people on your campus visit. And they're gonna ask you two questions. What are your most desired courses to teach? And also, what is your least desired course to teach? Have an answer to that. Don't say, I can teach anything because someone who teaches marketing analytics may be very, very different in terms of their, uh, you know, what turns them on in terms of teaching than say someone who teaches professional selling. That's not to say that they might be synergistic, but oftentimes what I have seen, those are very different. Um, uh, someone who is very industry oriented may have no interest in teaching CB and the converse of that may be true. It's okay to say that. Nobody expects you to be able to teach everything but they wanna know what you can teach and what you can do well and what you'd be happy doing, then they assess how that is a fit with their department and what their departmental needs are. Um, one other thing I wanna mention here that I didn't bullet point, you need to be aware, if you look at most institutions, we're seeing more and more uh, non-tenure track 
faculty ranks. Uh, they may be uh, professors of practice, lecturers, instructors, clinical professors. At the institutions that I've been with, uh, that I've been employed by Auburn and Clemson universities, these individuals have a vote in terms of who is hired. They have a vote and their vote is equal to the most senior named full professor, department chair, whatever, their vote is equal. You treat them with the same respect and you should get some understanding via the website about them as much as you would the most stellar and productive researcher in that particular department because they have a vote, they have a say. Um, so I'm gonna move forward, be prepared. If, if you are doing a presentation face-to-face -face in person, have multiple access to it. Have it on a memory stick, you know, have it on your phone if you have to. Um, forward it if, uh, if the school asks, and many will, could you forward your presentation beforehand? Forward it to them, but also make sure that you have multiple copies of it. There's nothing worse than when you get into a presentation and you have to go online to some website and pull up uh, your presentation and the department is sitting there watching. That, that can be a kiss of death for you, okay? Um, state specifically what you can do for the department and uh, what you can do for their mission. Um, and, and I can speak to this directly here at Auburn, we are interested in um, increasing our footprint in three areas, the graduate area, the sales area, and the marketing analytics area in terms of new programs that we're developing, new initiatives, uh, center activities that we're beginning to develop. Those are the important things that we want to hear how you can add to that. You know, how can you add to that? How can you add value to this? Now, obviously, they're going to be realistic knowing that you would be a junior faculty member and your service is going to be greatly reduced. But there are still ways that perhaps your research, uh, your teaching are all things that could possibly add to that mission. Um, next, be yourself. You know, be yourself. If you are yourself and you don't get a good feeling from this department, then it's not the right place for you. And you're doing yourself as much a favor that way than if you are not, then um, you're doing the department a favor. Just be yourself. Um, you can be your best self because nobody knows you better than you do. So be yourself. At the end, send personalized thank you notes and do it as quick as possible. So what is quick as possible? In my opinion, 48 hours. 48 hours after you return is a good time frame. And you want to be cognizant of writing something that is specific to the conversation that you had with that individual. That shows that you paid attention to them, and that's a great form of, of showing respect for them. Okay, here are some things you don't want to do. Don't name drop. It sounds very transparent. I've seen um, candidates come in and, you know, I work with this person. I know this part. I talk with this person and it's always the biggest, most seminal authors. And chances are that seminal author, they may remember you, but you're probably not best friends, okay? And there's a good chance you may not be doing work with them. So don't name draw, okay? You know, if you are specifically working with someone who is a seminal name, then okay. But name dropping is off put. Um, never, ever, ever ask about compensation. I think uh, Nina said it very well. You're in no position to do that until somebody calls you with an offer. When they call you and want to make you an offer, then you can discuss compensation, but not until then, okay? Um, Never, uh, don't promise things you can't deliver. You know, don't say I can teach anything. Don't say I guarantee, uh, you know, I, I'm gonna have uh, five JMs before I go up for tenure. Don't say that, that's not realistic, okay? And I'll try and move quickly through these. Never make a negative comment about anyone in the discipline. Listen, 
If it's not obvious to you now, after you spend some time going to a few conferences, you will see everybody knows everybody. And we talk in marketing about the strength of word of mouth. This is probably, uh, if you use like the bass modeling, uh, one of the fastest disseminations of information through any network, okay? Because this is a very small, well-connected network worldwide. Um, never insult your host. I uh, was on a, and I'm trying to give this story very quick. We had a campus visit a few years ago. I was uh, at lunch with a candidate, myself and another faculty member. Uh, I was talking about how the house next door to me wouldn't sell. And the candidate said, well, they probably found out you were the next door neighbor. Sure, it was probably meant in fun, but that, that candidate was right there. They killed themselves right there. And that's not the only experience that I have seen of people doing that. Um, when you go for a meal on a campus visit, do not under any circumstances order alcohol unless your host is ordering alcohol and says, feel free to order alcohol. Until then, do not do that. That's bad form. Um, give your host complete attention. Um, I've seen individuals on a campus visit who are at a meal, they immediately go to their phone. Put the phone away. Do not use your devices. Give your hosts 100% of your attention. I know another candidate who was doing well until lunch. They killed themselves doing that. Um, don't state the primary reason for your interest as being personal. Frank Adams mentioned this in his, and you may have saw me going like this. You know, if you've got family in Alabama or you'd like to be in a warm climate or you'd like to be in the South, wonderful. But I'm going to be honest with you, we don't care. We don't care about that. What we care about is what can you do to enhance the mission of our department, okay? What can you do to enhance the mission of our department? So, uh, thank you, and I'm going to uh, go ahead and stop now and let it be open for some question and answer. Sorry, I didn't mean to actually uh, click on that. Thank you so much, Chris. Um, we have some questions that I have already answered because they're very like simple ones, and maybe somebody had said something later. But I do have a few that I'm going to pull up here. Um, so one that somebody is uh, that a couple have asked are, you know, I don't have like an outstanding job market paper. Is that a disadvantage? You know, so maybe you don't have an A, uh, you know, your JM or JCR, but you have a good B journal. How do you suggest that that be handled at various institutions? I can speak to that. Um, present what is the best work that you have. You know, if you have, you may not have a, a JM or a JAMS, but if you've got a JBR or a Journal of Advertising, those are certainly very well-respected journals and they're very difficult to get in. Feel free to present that and people will respect that. It's if you have a, a JAMS or a JBR and then you go with a much lower tier type of thing, that gives cause for concern. I would be thinking, how much work did you actually do on it if you had a high-ranking paper and you can't talk about it? Yeah. I think and that would be my... What, what type of school are you applying for, right? So, I mean, if you are applying for a balanced school, then I don't think you need to necessarily be worried that you don't have a JM publication yet, right? Um, so, again, it always depends on that always goes back to what do you want? What is your what is your goal? What type of university institution are you applying for? And then that's how you need to position yourself. Like we're in marketing. Market yourself accordingly to what is your end goal, right? You, that needs to align. That is the most important thing. For me, that's, that's even something where I'm not gonna even invite you for an initial interview. If I see this inconsistency with what, my institution is going to offer, right? If, if I see that in your CV and in your cover letter, you're, you're telling me, 
I'm only gonna uh, send all my stuff to JM and JCR. This is the only outlets for me. Um, great, I'm not gonna waste my time on you. Like the, you're not compatible with our institution. I don't even know why you submitted your application here. Like you did not do your research. You don't really care about us. So it's not gonna go well, right? Again, it depends on your aspirations, where you wanna go. That's, it has to match on all ends and on both sides, right? So be smart about it. Varsha. Yeah, uh, Jenna, I just wanted to uh, say that uh, I agree with uh, what Anina and Chris has already said. I just want to build upon it further and say it's brand you. So brand you starts from your brand identity, who you are, and it reflects from your work. So it's okay if you have a B, uh, you know, journal, but then what is the area that you're working on? Is that interesting enough? Because if it's a new area, it's aligning with the university department uh, and the kind of stuff is they're doing, then definitely uh, you have a higher chance to get in. So present what you are and be what you want to be. And, you know, build a track which actually excites uh, the people to hire you because it, it has to be aligned with their interim goals. So that is something which you have to be careful about. Yeah. Thank you. Okay, we only have time for one last question. And um, there's one that is uh, we haven't covered as much, so I think it's a great question to end on, okay? Um, so we focused a lot on research and everything, but teaching is obviously a part of the job. And doctoral students don't always get to teach. Maybe they don't get to teach the classes they want. They're told by their department head, you're teaching this. So how do you suggest that they show that, you know, hey, I want to teach digital marketing or sales or whatever it is, and they don't have experience with teaching that? What do you look for? I think that was just, a, that's a great question to end on for this. Well, personally, I would that if you um, want to teach something that you haven't, uh, a good idea is to say something about the content that you would want to cover. Because what that implies is that you have given this thought, you have researched it, and you have figured out what you want to cover. Um, you know, there's a first time to teach everything. And it's not uncommon for somebody to want to teach something, particularly very early in their career, that they have not taught. So that, that's not a crime and that's not a weakness. But I think having some idea of what you would want to cover and how you would cover it, uh, that compensates for that issue. Okay. So, uh, well, Jenna, uh, I would respond in this way if uh, you've not taught, especially like, you know, an example which is coming in my mind is about digital marketing. So this is something uh, which keeps uh, changing and it's quite dynamic. And if you worked into that space, then probably the portfolio aligns with your experience, uh, your understanding about the area. And of course, uh, we understand when you're in the panel that you have not taught, but then at least if you have the basic understanding, we are sure that you will be able to deliver the kind of expectations which has been set up for that session. So uh, you need to have those kind of portfolios ready so that uh, it will help you to uh, take and conduct that session. Yeah, and for us, um, we always usually list the class that we have immediate needs for first and the job posting, or we might say like, right now we need to fill this, right? Um, so if that is the class that you want to teach, then I would list that. And if the courses that you already have experience is, is also listed as alternative, then mention that. And that would actually be an advantage because now you cover, let's say two or three of the classes, right? Rather than just one, which gives an, a, a department more flexibility of being able to use you in the future, right? Because we always have needs of filling classes and being able to use a faculty member when we are short staffed in a different course. So the fact that you really wanna teach a certain class and you also have experience in another class that could actually be an advantage. So it's just how you position it. Like for me, I didn't start off teaching research, but the way I positioned myself was 
I learned about all of these techniques during my dissertation and I really want to teach research. But I also know how to teach services because I have that experience as well. And that's why I got hired and I started off with research. Then I as well, now I'm responsible for teaching services as well because whenever there's a shortage, I can jump in. So it gives more flexibility to the department and they really like that, right? So I can cover two classes when there needs to be somebody there. So it can be good. Like you don't have to have that experience. It's just how, how do you utilize that skill? How do you advertise it, right? Don't say, oh, I don't have any experience. I know I'm gonna be terrible, but you know, hire me anyway. That's not gonna get you in the door, right? Well, thank you everybody. So we do have a few questions that have already been submitted. However, I know all of you have teaching and things like that. So what I wanna do is thank everybody for coming. And then if your schedule allows it, if we could stay on a few more minutes um, and I will stay on to answer, try to answer some of these as well, since I have been on numerous search committees myself, however, you know, this was meant to be for an hour, so I do want to say goodbye and thank you. And if you do have time to stay and talk a little bit more, I would very much appreciate that. But once again, thank you. Thank you for everybody who attended. Um, I hope you found this to be um, informative. We really wanted to give you practical advice on, you know, navigating this job market. And I do uh, welcome all of you to check out the Academy of Marketing Science uh, Web page and one last thing also is if you are you know going to be in the U.S. in November, um, SMA Society for Marketing Advances is going to have um, academic placement services. So I suggest that you look at their website and register for academic placement services. It'll be in Orlando, November as it third through the sixth, Chris. So I strongly suggest you do that since AMA did not have theirs in. August, if you can. So any last words from all of you before anybody has to leave? Good luck. You can do it. That's all right. <laughs> Stay calm. Like Frank said, it is a process. It might seem crazy. Don't uh, compare yourself to anybody else. You know, like don't go crazy if everybody else in your cohort already has a campus visit schedule. You know, just keep to yourself and use the time wisely. It will work out. You will find a job. I just wanted to say that, you know, uh, when you're applying for any job, be clear in what you want to do and what your future plans are and how it uh, develops that congruency with that university so that it is a win-win situation for both because interim results and the goals have to be matched. Uh, unless that happens, uh, it would become really challenging. So be clear on that track. I think once the clarity is developed and how you can contribute, I think that really helps uh, while positioning yourself and branding yourself to that university. Just gonna say best of luck with your search. Um, wish you the very best uh, and welcome to the discipline. And thanks for listening. Thank you all. So thank you, everybody. Have a great day. I will be staying behind to try to help those of you who had some questions that um, couldn't be answered. So thank you. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, everyone. Thank you, Varsha. Thank you, Nina. Thank you, Chris. And you're welcome to stay behind. I just know you all have very busy schedules with semester starting. So. Um, I'm going to stay behind for a little bit if anybody to try to answer some of these. And well, it looks like uh, nobody is like running off. So I am going to throw this out here. If somebody, what are your thoughts on people who don't have any real work experience as far as with teaching? How important is that in marketing that they've had some work experience? Anybody want to take that, the work experience question? Well, I think it's certainly beneficial because, um, you know, we're teaching individuals to enter industry. If you have industry experience, it gives you, the instructor, 
and the department credibility. It provides a great deal of credibility. It's uh, very hard for someone to be very um, credible to an audience, teaching people to do something that they've never done themselves. So tremendous amount, or not even tremendous, but some amount of industry experience is definitely a plus when it comes to the instructional process. Okay, so somebody is asking here, pipeline, you know, how many papers? I would just say with that, you know, you wanna have papers in the pipeline, but you also don't wanna have too many projects so that nothing gets completed. You need to have some, you know, something published. What is your thoughts on that? Well, I think that, uh, you know, if it is accepted, I think it's really good. Uh, if it is not, then probably, uh, you know, conference papers at least uh, can be there. And those conference papers, how you are converting it to a journal article. And as Nina has already mentioned that uh, you have to be realistic. I mean, if you're doing an advertising research and you say that I want to submit it to a J or JR, it makes sense. And um, how your planning and strategy is to convert it, I think that adds a lot of value. And when you are coming for the interview, uh, I'm sure the assessments can be made very easily. What I would suggest that what should not be done is that if you, your portfolio cannot be all over the place. For example, I was interviewing a person and uh, he was into sales, he was into digital, sustainability, all the papers all over the place. And I could not find the focus area. So I was a little lost in terms of understanding what exactly that person would like to do. So those candidates, I think, uh, is a little challenging to get in. But as long as you are able to uh, sustain with your research areas and you are able to say that this is where you are heading, this is where your, uh, you know, progress in is in terms of your results. And of course, if you have an acceptance, it goes very well. But if you don't have, then at least you can talk about it and say that what's your plan, how you're developing it further. So that helps. I don't think that there's like a golden number that I'm looking for, right? I can't tell you like, oh, you need to have five, you need to have 10, you need to have 20. I don't think that there is a number I'm looking for. I'm looking for at least a few, right? I need, to, I need to see something. For me, it's very important that I see conference attendance somewhere, right? I need to see that you are actively participating in uh, conferences, that you have been doing something, even if you don't have a publication yet, if you're right out of the degree program, right? But that you're active, right? That you are working on it. Uh, the worst that you could do is have nothing, no conference proceeding, no nothing. But then tell me, well, I, I just submitted to JM. Okay, so you hit the submit button, right? It's not even under review, like under second round of review, do you just hit the submit button so that you can tell me that you submitted it? So it's gonna be desk rejected tomorrow. That doesn't count, right? So you need to be active, um, but there is no golden number that we can give you. What I wanna see is that you have different projects or papers in different stages. Right? I want to see that you have presented something and it's about to be submitted. I want to see that you have submitted something and it might be under review, a different like second round of review. I want to see that you're just developing something. And I want to see that you also are leading a project. Right, This is your idea. And maybe that you're working with people that might necessarily just be your cohort. Right, I want to see that you're establishing connections with other people at other institutions already. This is important because you are about to move away, right? You cannot no longer rely on your, your current network. You need to build relationships, right? What, what happens when you leave your institutions? Are you gonna fall apart? That's what I need to see, that you can function when you're no longer at that institution. You're gonna be surrounded by new people. Then what, right? That is important. Um, so that's what I'm looking for. There is no good number, but I need to see that you are gonna continue to function once you're away from your dissertation chair, right? Once you're away from the current cohort, that's important for me. So show me that you have submitted something, show me that you're about to attend another conference, show me that something is under review and then we're good. And it's not all the same paper, by the way, right? 
they'll tell me, I have one paper, but I've submitted at four different conferences. But that's not what I'm talking about. <laughs> it's the same paper, right? We can see through that as well. <laughs> it's gotta be something different. Um, and then, then you're good, right? Then, then I, I have more faith in your ability to sustain yourself for the next three years. I don't wanna hire you and constantly be worried that you're, you're not gonna produce anything. That's, that's our worry. That's really what it's all about, that we're gonna hire you and then you're not doing anything. Like we see you in the office and you're on Facebook 24 seven. Like that's not productive. Unless you're doing digital research, then okay, you're collecting data, great. Right, that's, that's what it's all about for us. Nina, what you said about working with others, you know, sometimes I think doctoral students forget that when you leave your institution, there's gonna be new doctoral students at your institution. So you have to learn how to lead a research project. You have to learn how to connect with other people, whether it's even within your own cohort, um, but that you can do research projects that are not led by your professors because yeah. they'll have their new students. Yeah, they do. Like all of a sudden you're no longer the firstborn. Right, like you move all of it, like you're not the, mm -hmm. the child anymore, you know, and that's normal because again, they get new doctoral students and that's that's how it should be. So um, you need to be able to deal with that. You're, and it's the doctoral time is very demanding, but when you're in it, you don't notice that that's all you're doing. You're really focusing on research all the time. And once you start your job, it's, uh, it's different, right? You have other responsibilities, you're acclimating to a new environment, you have to prep maybe for a new class, if not for a new type of environment, new students. And it's all of a sudden the first semester is done and you're like, what, what happened, right? Like I had all these plans, I was gonna submit to JM and that never happened. And now your, your promise, as Chris said, for like the five JM papers by tenure, that's uh, uh, down the drain already, right? Chris, I have a, I do have a question I want to target to Chris, um, and this came up about, you know, what do you do if you get an offer and you are, um, you've interviewed with other places and you need to make the decision before you've heard from the other places. Now, I know what my answer would be, but I would like to hear what you have to say as a department chair as far as that. Well, and, and I mean, I experienced the exact same thing when I first came in. And, um, you know, a school or an institution is going to give you a time frame where they're going to need an answer. And most of the time, it's going to be one week. It may be 10 days. I know we're going to do one week here at Auburn. We did the same thing at Clemson. Um, in essence, what you have to do as the candidate, then you have to decide. You have to decide. Um, you can't keep a school waiting. That would be very poor form. That's disrespectful to them. So then, you know, you've got to ask yourself, is this offer that I have right now is something that, that I'm interested in and can move on? If you think that you will be getting another offer for somewhere else that is more desirable to you, then you can gamble. But it's, it's a tough situation, but that you have to decide. You have to decide. You've got a week, you've got to figure it out. I remember, Chris, when I was a doc student, be a, being an SMA's doctoral consortium, and I know you were a part of it, and I don't remember if this came from you or somebody else, because this has been, you know, like 12 years ago, so I have forgotten some details, but somebody yeah. said, remember, a bird in the hand and some, you know, it's not a great market this year. And when you've got an offer, I mean, you applied at that school, so you must have had some interest. I, I was actually going to use that colloquialism bird in the hand. I would, but <laughs> I may not know that. But you probably are the one who said it that time. But I mean, you got a job offer when it's not a good market, and you did apply, so. You must have liked something about the school. I know I would be taking it. I know actually when I went on the market, it wasn't a great market. 
And um, I had other campus visits scheduled and they were like, you have to make the decision. And I made the decision to take that job. I, and I had I, a job then the next year. When I came out, it was a really good market. Um, Mine was I had, I had three offers before I went to Clemson and I told them and thank God they gave me an answer within a month, within a week before I had to let these others know. But uh, I mean, I was this close to going to Memphis and, um, but anyway, it worked out, but I got lucky that, that, uh, that it worked out that way. That was just a matter of dumb luck on, for me. So, um, which by the way, that, there's a lot of luck involved in what we do, particularly start really getting active in research. It's the luck of the reviewers. It's luck of, so anyway, I'm just saying um, we can't control everything. Yeah. I would say when you're done with the campus visit, right, write down your initial gut reaction. Did you like the place? Did you like the people? Was it good? And write it down. And if your gut reaction right afterwards was like, oh, I can't work with these people, then you already made your decision, right? And if your gut reaction was like, oh, I love the place. This was great. I had a great time. Everybody was so friendly. Then when you get the offer, what are you waiting for, right? If you like the place, just go with it, right? But if your gut reaction was, this was so awkward, there was just something wrong. Like I did not feel comfortable at all. They, and don't go with it. Like, but write it down right after you're done with that, with this, with the campus visit, right? Like, that would be my advice. Like, that's what I do. I always wrote down exactly everything, the pros and cons, right that night while while I was still in the in the hotel. So I know while I was still there, right? So I have all of that information and the data, and that's how I make my decisions. So a couple of people have asked the same question. And I'm going to say an answer, but I want you all to add on to it if you think there's more to add. They're asking like, when can I actually start applying for jobs or I haven't completed this? My rule of thumb that I tell people usually is apply when you know you will be done before that job would start. So like jobs are being posted right now. Occasionally schools will take you ABD, but usually they expect that you would be complete doctor in hand when you would start that job next fall. Some exceptions, and it does happen, but what is your thought on this? Anybody, anything else than that, like you'd be expected that you would be done or at least very close to done and they would negotiate that with you. But, and it's also gonna depend, our ones aren't gonna I, take you. Chris? I, I, I would agree with that, what you just said, Tana. I agree completely with that. And for us, we're not going to hire you unless you have to be done by the start date. And if not, like if literally, if you cannot finish, we're going to revoke contract. It's in our contract. So if you cannot, if you did not defend and you did not graduate, you can't start. So that's, it doesn't really matter what, what happened before, but you have to be graduated by the time you start. We do not hire anybody ABD. So that's what you need to think about. Are you going to be done? Are you going to be graduated? Varsha, do you have anything to add to that? Yeah, I think it depends upon the school. Uh, some schools actually say that uh, you can go back and complete the defense and uh, then, uh, you know, can join us. So what I suggest is that it depends upon the university where you are applying and uh, what is the duration uh, which you're looking for. And then accordingly, you can take a call. Because uh, some of the universities, I agree that uh, the rule of thumb that you mentioned, but that doesn't apply for certain markets. They would say that, yes, the candidate is good, so you can go back and then maybe uh, they also provide a certain time period under which they would have to work and then come back to their university. So essentially, it depends upon uh, that university and the rules under which sometimes, you know, visa rules are also very uh, different for different countries. And uh, depending upon that, uh, you would have to take a decision. That would be uh, my suggestion to the candidate. Well, I did go ABD, but I do wanna say one thing about this. When you negotiate that in a contract, 
I will tell you, I have known people who did not finish. I did. I actually got done faster than what they told me because I didn't want to take any chances. But I have known people who've negotiated where they could go ABD and not done and did not finish. And they were told, don't come back this fall. Like if a school lets you come ABD, I mean, I know someone I can, that that happened to. No job that fall. You're done. So take it seriously. Um, I think that's about all of the questions and I do actually need to also in this now, um, you know, please feel free to reach out. I am going to put um, my email in here. So if anybody felt like their question wasn't answered, um, I'm putting it in uh, the, let me see, I'm going to put it in the chat box. I was in the, put that in the chat. Okay. I am putting in my email address and please feel free to reach out to me. I'm also on LinkedIn um, and there is my email. If there was a question that you had that you would like a little bit more guidance, assistance, we, uh, we want to help. And uh, I can also send that out to somebody else, okay? So we do have some, like I said, we do need to go now. A few of you are starting to put in some more questions. Just please send those to me. And if I can't answer it, I will send it to one of the panelists and see if they can help you, okay? Thank you so much for joining us today. Everyone, have a great day. Thank you so much, Anna. Thank you, Chris. Thank, Thank you. you. All right, bye everybody.